and welcome everyone to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council. Welcome to the councillors, to staff, to the media and to the public. Uh, our prayer today will be led by the Reverend Richard Dawson of St Stephen's Presbyterian Church, Leith Valley. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's a delight for me to be here. I'm tempted to say that for my sins, I am a Presbyterian minister, and that may be closer to the truth than you imagine. But uh, it's great to, uh, to, to do these sort of things and to uh, be something of a blessing to you. So without delay, shall we pray? Loving Creator God, we gather before you ready to serve the people of this fair city. A city founded to be a light to the nation and a witness in this world to your love and mercy. We pray for this city, that it would be a place of refuge for the weary, provision for the poor, shelter to the stranger, wisdom to the simple, kindness to the despised, wholeness to the broken, health to the sick, light to those in darkness, and joy for the downcast. So work in and through us that we might bless the people we serve and serve the people who've blessed us with this position. Deliver us from evil and lead us now to unite for the sake of this place and for your purposes for good. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, there are, we have a full deck, so there are no apologies. I'll move on, and from the chair, I'll move that the agenda as published be confirmed. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item three is a declaration of interest for noting. Item four, and I'll move from the chair that the public part of the meetings of the extraordinary meeting of the Dunedin City Council, held on the 3rd of July 2014, be confirmed as a correct record. Second to Councillor Staines. Is there any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, I'll further move that the public part of the minutes of the meeting of the Dunedin City Council held on the 18th of August 2014 be confirmed as a correct record. Second to Councillor Staines. Discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Minutes of committees. The Hearings Committee. Uh, item 5. Thanks. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the minutes of the Hearings Committee meeting held on the 8th and 13th of August 2014 be noted. Second, Councillor Vandervis. And I note that Councillor Hall has uh, sat sitting back. Um, any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 6, Community and Environment Committee, Councillor McTavish. I uh, move your worship that part A, items 1 to 6 and 8 to 9 of the minutes of the Community and Environment meeting held on the 1st of September 2014 be noted. <coughs> Second to Councillor Pete. I'll move further that the following part B item of the minutes of the Community and Environment meeting held on 1st September 2014 be approved, that being item 7, the hospital therapeutic, Dunedin Hospital Therapeutic Pool. And, and I'll move part number 3 as well, that part C item 10 of the minutes of the Community and Environment meeting held on the 1st of September be taken in the non public part of the meeting. And you have to see all that. Councillor Pete, any discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 7, Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I move that the minutes of the Planning and Regulatory Committee of the 2nd of September be noted. Seconded, Councillor Hawkins. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, item 8, Infrastructure Services Committee, Councillor Wilson. I'll move that the public parts of the minutes of the Infrastructure Services Committee, excluding item 7, be he um, held on the 2nd of September 2014, be noted. Second to Councillor Lord. Um, um, just, for, um, yeah, just for clarification, item 7 is regarding the Warrington boulders. Yes, and uh, uh, that's in order for the Council to consider the public's forum submissions yeah. and deal with it separately. Yeah. So, I, as I've noted, I have a suggestion, um, which we can make for that. <laughs> Councillor Noon. Can we also have item 4? Uh, taken separately too, please. Okay, so we'll leave item four out at the moment. Thank you. And item seven. You have to <coughs> you, you your... Move those. Right. Second to Councillor Lord. 
Any discussion on those items other than council, um, item four and seven? And then, being none, I'll put all those in favour. Please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Now, um, just while we check, to see. Your worship. Oh. Your Worship, we do need to confirm the minutes as far as item 7 goes. They are, I didn't want to make any um, comment on them being incorrect. They do need to be moved at some stage, but it's whether there's a subsequent motion. All right. Well, let's um, deal with item 4 first. Councillor Noon. Thank you, Worship. Um, for the benefit of councillors who, who were unable to attend the Infrastructure Services Committee, meeting of which there was uh, several I think. Um, essentially we have an application from a, uh, a developer to name a road, um, Kenros Lane, and essentially the Infrastructure Services Committee decided that did, that didn't meet the criteria or the guidelines that the, um, the road naming policy has, and the committee chose to uh, essentially vote down that uh, that proposal from the developer and add a second recommendation which uh, is our staff to review the policy. I didn't vote in favour of that um, for a couple of reasons. One was that the, the proposal may not meet all the guidelines um, that the council has with regards to this policy but it certainly meets some. Uh, the people that have proposed, or the, the company I suppose, family that have proposed this particular road naming are a family that have been uh, living in the Soyuz Bay area for, for many, many years, the Lang family. Unfortunately, Ken Lang passed away several years ago. Uh, extremely well-respected family in the community. Uh, they, they have chosen this particular name. Obviously, they've had discussions with, um, with the, the relevant staff and have come up with something that they believe and suits uh, their requirements. And I just feel disappointed that we, as, as council, have uh, used th this particular application as an example to justify a review. Uh, I certainly don't support a review and I certainly don't support the turning down of this, this request. It did go to the community board, the Chalmers Community Board. They did consider it. Uh, they did support it. Um, so it's not as if this has just come from left field. Um, it has been through um, a local process and I'm just disappointed that, that we feel as council um, we know better. Um, the name certainly doesn't reflect or conflict with any existing name um, on the uh, the registered street names or, or road names in general that the city has. Uh, so I will certainly be asking council to consider sending this back and for infrastructure services to reconsider their position. One would be a we don't conduct a review, and b that we that we support the proposal from. The developer. Okay, so I take it that what you're doing, Councillor Noon, is um, can we assume that um, Councillor Wilson, as the chair, will move item four? And what you're indicating is that you wish uh, Council, uh, your urging Council to decline. Councillor McTash. I'm just wondering, for clarification, given that that was a Part A item and the committee had delegation to decide on that matter, right. what is it precisely that we... Um, then, um, the only, <coughs> as I understand it, and I, I'm open to correction from Ms Graham, but you're quite right to draw that to my attention, Council cannot overrule that, it at most can send it back. So. My suggestion is the way we deal with it is that Councillor Wilson moves it individually so that we, we know what we're talking about. If it's lost, then um, um, uh, unless, um, you might guide me here, Ms Graham, but if Councillor Noon were to move a procedural motion, it, do I have to, do we need to take the, the Chair's move, uh, resolution first? Note the minutes. So the minutes do need to be approved because they are the minutes of the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then a procedural motion could be moved. The, and the, in this case, I think the only option open to Council is to refer the matter back to the committee. Um, but that would have to be by someone who hasn't spoken, given it's a procedural motion, but would have to be by someone who hasn't sp spoken to the matter. All right. Um, 
Councillor Wilson, can I ask you to move the, that the minutes be noted for both four and seven, and then that's out of the road, because they have to be anyway. That's out of the road, and then I invite, and I take it that in a sense you've precluded yourself from that procedural motion. By the sound of it, Your Worship, but sorry. Um, by the sound of it, Your Worship, but I can make some additional comments that may help um, <laughs> encourage some of my comments. <laughs> is that. <laughs> no? Well, can, can I, is it, let's, let's do this one first, sir. Council I'll move that the uh, minutes on relating to items four and item seven be um, noted. Seconded, Councillor Lord. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. That's not approving it. They didn't need to be approved. They just need to be noted. Now, is there anyone would, would who, anyone who would like to move, Councillor Bazzi? I move that item four be sent back to the Infrastructure Services Committee for uh, reconsideration. Is there a second of that? Second, Councillor Lord. Uh, being a procedural motion, there's no um, discussion. So I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No. Can I have a show of hands, please, for those who wish to send it back? Those who wish to send it back to the committee, one, two, three, four, five. Those who don't, it's lost. Now, on to. Do you wish to. I know when I'm beaten. <laughs> Right, um, item seven, I noted at the end of the public forum that I had a suggestion for a way forward that would, within standing orders, um, address, uh, provide a process to address the issues that are raised. And, I, and again, I'll be corrected by Ms Graham if I get this wrong, but my understanding is, since it was a part A item, the decision was made by the committee and uh, then having not been a notice of motion in adequate time before this meeting, council cannot, no, no resolution to overturn that can be raised here. So most that uh, it could be sent back to the committee for um, reconsideration or whatever. Uh, I was, uh, I guess for the, for the purposes of discussion, I'll, put a, I'll move from the chair uh, a resolution that I think provides a process to address the issues. And that um, most resolution is that in addition to monitoring the safety concerns relating to the bank and Bay Road track for the six month period, that staff also consider the other matters that have been raised, including those of DOC. You'll note that we, re that we received a copy of the letter to the Wakawati Community Board from DOC, uh, which I've discussed with DOC today and include any information on those issues in the report back to his Seconded by Councillor uh, Staines. Um, I'm putting that up as much as anything, to, two reasons. I'm putting it up um, to provide a way forward to address the issues, which I know that some councillors wish to, and um, because the process that is allowed to us is, um, is a little constrained. My understanding is that council cannot overturn the committee's decision and staff cannot overturn it either. So it stands until such time as um, it is reconsidered completely. So for the purposes uh, uh, of addressing the issues that were raised today, uh, I suggest that those issues be included in the review that we agreed to and resolved at the um, Infrastructure Services Committee meeting. I now invite um, discussion. Councillor Newton. It's, it's more of a question, Your Worship. Um, there is another option, essentially, and it's to refer the item back to the Infrastructure Services Committee in light of what has been presented today by the public, yep. by the public forum. Yep. So th that is an alternative. That's fine, and, and I anticipated that that's an alternative to this. So, so if this fails, I will move. You have received indication that it gets referred back to IS. That's fine. Councillor Benson Park. Under this recommendation, the ROS would be removed and the monitoring as originally agreed would take place as well as what's been suggested. Well, my understanding is that the rocks will be removed at any time as per the instruction of the Infrastructure Services Committee. Because Council can't 
overrule it now and staff uh, obliged to take instruction from count from the committee. But if the matter once the once the minutes have been noted, but if the matter were referred back, that would essentially put a hold on that action. I don't know if it would. I'll let ask Council uh, Ms. Graham. Um, staff have been doing some planning around the, based on the resolution of the committee to remove the rocks around improving the safety. Um, and Mr. Lorenzo has got some uh, plans around that because we've acted on the assumption that the committee made the decision that we were going to implement it um, to remove the rocks. So unless there is a, a counter to that, our understanding is that the rocks will be removed. What uh, Jean is circulating at the moment is um, some safety features that would be put in uh, at that corner to deal with some of the safety concerns. So based on the current resolution, we could um, remove the rocks tomorrow. does. The question was whether or not it would make sense for the rocks to be removed or, or, or whether we would have an ISCOM meeting before the rocks were Presumably we could have a um, extraordinary infrastructure services meeting after this meeting or at some other time given how urgent the matter is, given that we wouldn't want to be spending a whole load of ratepayers money removing rocks if they were to be put back pending well, with, with respect, that, the, that was envisaged they'd be gone for six months while the review occurred. That was the intention of the Infrastructure Committee's uh, decision. But it's, it's, I would like to second a motion of Andrews, which I don't think he has to wait until this motion is done. <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to resolve here is, is a matter of process. Infrastructure services made a decision which they had a right to make and it was their call. They gave an instruction for the rocks to be removed. Council is not in a position to overrule that at this point. So what, what I'm hearing, in fact, the question has been asked why they're still there, uh, given that that was the resolution of the Infrastructure Services Committee. So the question is, and, and I guess it's more a process one from Ms Graham, can, can I just ask another question because Ms Graham may be able to comment on that as well. Um, it, it's hard to believe, and I, I wasn't here for the public forum because there were a number of us, all of it, a number of us were at a hearing as you know, but I heard what I heard and um, there's obviously an issue, um, but surely if the rocks haven't been removed and the, this matter council were to decide to refer this back to the committee for consideration whenever, it's hard to believe that the rocks would be removed before that reconsideration had happened. Is well, that's, what, that's why I'm asking for direction from governance, in that, as I understand it, Council is not in a position to give an instruction that overrules... Well, that effectively would be the case. That's what I'm asking for clarification of. It's, it's a, so, Mr Avery. Um. Um, strain into governance questions, but um, at the moment what we've got is a resolution, clear resolution to remove the rocks um, and to do monitoring for six months. I'm unclear. If you were to issue an instruction or mean that resolution asking us to hold or pause or whatever, then we can do that or we can just decide to not implement it immediately. Um, 
Can I help you, Worship? I'm happy to move my yeah. procedural motion immediately. What I'm, look, what I'm trying to ascertain is whether we can actually effectively overrule <coughs> a decision that the committee made and had a right to make. It's as simple as that. And we can't. <laughs> I think you can't overturn the previous committee's decision, but operationally we could make a decision not to be in too much of a hurry, if you would like, while we investigate the issues that were raised today. Um, I mean, given that it's been how many weeks and we haven't taken the rocks away yet, uh, if you would like us to take our time operationally, this is slightly irregular, but it's the best thing I can think of and to if, if that's the will of the council. Well, so, leaving, leaving that as it may, I'm happy to re resolve this, um, the motion that I've put, and if it's turned down, then we come back to um, Councillor Noon's motion. So, can I just clarify, Your Worship, that you won't accept a procedural motion until you deal with the one that's on the... Um, that am I able to? That what? Yep. Okay. Then... I'm advised that I can receive a, 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 a procedural motion halfway through the consideration of uh, uh, the one that's on the table. So yes, I will. I'm happy to move that uh, item seven be referred back to Infrastructure Services Committee meeting for consideration, and that the, ro the rocks remain in place in the meantime. Well, I think we've got the CEO's assurance. I don't think you've I'm not saying. I didn't say don't take the rocks away. But what I'm saying is that the rocks remain in the meantime because I'm saying after the, the chief has ind indicated operationally we've got some other important, more important things to do and in the meantime this is a low priority, that's what I'm understanding. Um, well, obviously. I'll accept the first part of the resolution, <laughs> I think the second part, it's fine, they, they're not going to go anywhere, but I can't, it, it contradicts standing orders to include the second bit. As my, as my well, can, can I put it another way? Uh, that I note the Chief Executive's response in terms of the timing of any rock removal. That's fine. Leave it like that. That's fine. Thank you. And that follows on from the first part of your procedural motion, which was referring it back to sure. Infrastructure Services Committee. That's good. All right. Is there a second for that? Councillor Benson Pope. Right. Now, um, I had a list here of people who wish to speak, but can I start it again, given that this is a new... Procedural. Procedural, Procedural motion. Of course, I'm going to put it. That makes it so much easier. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Could I have a show of hands, please? All those in favour, please raise their hand. One, two, three, five, two, six, seven, eight. All those against? It's carried. Right. Um... That resolves uh, item eight. Thank you. Item nine, economic development committee, council of state. Sorry, Your Worship, if I can um, move that the oh, part of the item 13 of the minutes of the Infrastructure Services Committee meeting held on the 2nd of September 2014 be taken in non public part of the meeting. Second. Councillor Hawkins, all those uh, discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 9, Economic Development Committee. Councillor Stokes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I move that the minutes of the Economic Development Committee meeting held on the 8th of September 2014 <coughs> be noted. Second, Councillor Pazin. Discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Finance Committee. Councillor Thompson, item 10. Your Worship, I move that the public part of the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting held on 8th of September 2014 be noted, and that Part C, Items 8 and 9 of the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting held on 8th of September 2014 be taken in the non-public part of the meeting. Seconded by Councillor McTavish. Any discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Audit and Risk Subcommittee, Councillor Thompson. Um, I'll move that the public part of the minutes of the Audit and Risk Subcommittee meeting held on the 5th of August 2014 be noted, and that Part C, Items 6 to 11 of the minutes of the Audit and Risk Subcommittee meeting held on the 5th of August be taken in the non-public part of the meeting. 
Second to Councillor Staines. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? <coughs> Carried. Minutes of the Community Boards, Wakawaiti Coast, Councillor Newton. Thank you, Worship. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Wakawaiti Coast Community Board held on the 13th of August 2014 be noted. Second. Second to Councillor Wilson. Discussion? I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 13, Otago Peninsula Community Board, Councillor Peck. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Otago Peninsula Community Board held on 14 August two, uh, 2014 be noted. Second to Councillor Wilson. No discussion. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 14, Strathtyre Community Board, Councillor Lord. I'd just like to move that the minutes of the Strathtyre Community Board, also held on the 14th of uh, August, be noted. Second to Councillor Wilson. No discussion. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 15, Mosgill Tyre Community Board, Councillor Wilson. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Mosgill Tyre Community Board held on the 19th of August 2014 be noted. Second to Councillor Lord. No discussion. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 16, Chalmers Community Board, Councillor Newton. Thank you, Worship. I move the minutes of the meeting of the Chalmers Community Board held on the 20th of August 2014 be noted. Second to Councillor McTavish. No discussion. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item 17, Saddle Hill Community Board, Councillor Wiley. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the minutes of the meeting of the Saddle Hill Community Board held on the 1st of August 2014 be noted. Second to Councillor Noon. Discussion? Put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. That's the community boards. Now onto the reports. Item 18, the Tourism to Need Annual Report, the final one. Please uh, come up. I was looking for. Welcome, Ray. You're up there. Would you like to just um, run down on it? Or do you want to just go straight into questions? Uh, a little bit of a run down on it, if I may. It's good. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself, if I may. Oh, yes. Dave, I haven't met a number of the councillors, so for your information, my name's Ray Grubb, and I live in the independent province of Karatani under Mr Noon. Um, I've been a trustee of Tourism to them for some time, and I apologise for the absence of Trish Oakley, our chair, who's unavoidably not able to attend. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to this, which is the final report as trustees of Tourism Dunedin. We're proud to have led the organisation collectively over many years. This included what my colleagues in the industry regard as the most challenging period of rapid change in tourism New Zealanders experience, particularly in the South Island. This job has been no sinecure at times. This also included significant administrative change over the past 12 months leading to the formation of Enterprise Dunedin. <coughs> As trustees for skills in aviation, retail and wholesale distribution, boutique and large scale operations and brand and marketing, we have sought to contribute effectively as governors, guiding the organisation strategically, both in operational structures and operational achievement and in long term direction. We have also established proper governance systems. All of this has been appropriate to the level of resources available. I'll deal first with the last 12 months, if I may. Transitioning into the single marketing agency has been a major undertaking while also continuing business as usual. We'd like to, as trustees, acknowledge the outstanding work of Hamish and his team during what has been an unsettling period. They've shown an unwavering commitment to Dunedin throughout that period and it shows their skills as professionals. Several councillors will be aware that the formation of the single agency reflects the aims and objectives that we as the Board of Tourism Dunedin have been discussing for a long period. From the start of the transition process, we set an ambition at the governance, management and team level to ensure a smooth transfer. We consider we've engaged appropriately throughout that. 
And we would like as an organisation to acknowledge the constructive and open dialogue we've had with uh, Sue Bidrose, Chief Executive. We'd like to thank her for her goodwill and support during the transition. And the other trustees would like to recognise the contribution Tris Oakley has made to the process. Unravelling and then re-ravelling, uh, I think there's a word like that, um, a CCO and a trust is a process which could easily have gone pear-shaped. It didn't. That's because it was done very well by those two in particular. Transition is now complete. Council's attention is now on a broader mandate. We're confident the former Tourism Dunedin team will put their understanding of brand and their collective contribution to the brand into marketing Dunedin to good effect. As a city, if we can convey effectively what brand Dunedin is and how to deliver on its promise, if we can promote its wider and wider use by Dunedin businesses of all kinds and by Dunedin people, inside their own branding and marketing efforts will get further as a city. The visitor economy is just one part of the brand, but has long been established. The more positive the experiences our visitors have, the wider the benefits. And that's not only economic benefits, that's image benefits in particular to the broader destination. I'll move to the operational achievements since our last report. I made that report and signalled then that we had, in our term as trustees, completed restructuring, recruited a staff of sought-after professionals, been putting in the necessary attention to getting results in this new, dynamic, and at times quite disturbed tourism environment. We've seen a 5.4% increase in domestic visitors, a 3.9% increase in international visitors for the year ending December 13, and we've got more recent figures showing a 6.3% increase in domestic, 92 in international. And that's plus a couple of hundred thousand cruise boats, passengers and crew who do not get counted in the stats because they don't actually land in New Zealand and fill out arrival cards. This is good planning, good staff work and doing our core job pretty well. We're all familiar with the stunning growth of the internet, the impact of Canterbury earthquake, demise of coach travel in favour of cruise boats, significant increase in aviation traffic into Queenstown, Queenstown's significant and increasing position as a South Island hub to rival Christchurch, and that is going to have a major impact in the future, and the growth of the fly and flop market as it's termed, I hate that expression. Um, the global financial crisis continuing impact on long haul markets and the high New Zealand dollar have affected our traditional markets, which are traditionally those that are best for Dunedin. But on the flip side, we're seeing New Zealand enjoying a fast emerging China travel market. <coughs> we're acutely aware of the opportunities presented by our sister city relationship with China, with Shanghai, particularly in this 20 year anniversary year. The results reflect the ongoing positioning of Dunedin in our, in our clearly defined target markets. The positioning includes a series of very effective seasonal campaigns, like the recent Winter Wonderland and Dunna Stunner campaigns, and direct marketing partnerships with industry. It reflects the return of the Town Hall as a conference destination, the importance of events and activities to the city. The quality and diversity of events and activities and offer Dunedin is an important component of the positioning of the city as an attractive destination. It's also an area which our board believes has further and considerable opportunities. Another major highlight this last year is the extensive media and PR work and the resultant cost effective marketing this is represented for the city that gave us an equivalent <coughs> advertising value of over a million dollars. And that's a remarkable achievement for a city this size. Interesting and engaging stories that are real and believable reflect the essence of what it means to visit Dunedin. This work demonstrates industry-leading achievement by our media person. It also demonstrates the investment in media hosting pays off. With both domestic and international media coverage, this has all been about driving preference for Dunedin and we can see through the visitor numbers the effect this is having. 
Another area you'd probably never hear about is the where we're getting highest quality results from an experienced industry insider on our staff is an agent education. Every agent that recommends to need in a brochure online expands our marketing in the most cost effective way and endorses our city. We're doing very, very well here indeed in this area. Uh, traditional media and agent distribution channels have established avenues, but Dunedin is a digital city. The impact of tourism in Dunedin's early and priority attention to technology <coughs> is evident in our results, with website visitation up 54% and social media fan acquisition up 53%. Last year I talked a little about our website, and this year we've put up some images on the screen here to show you the type of work that's being done on the web, both for mobile and for fixed sites. Our work on digital was limited by the resignation of Josh Jenkins, who moved into another area for the city. But even with this transition to the city council underway, our staff have maintained our digital market leading position. And I think the results are pretty sad evident. The thing I have to emphasize is we live in an interconnected world. There's unprecedented levels of information flows and nowadays our whole city is open to immediate scrutiny by anyone who wants to know about it. From a visit perspective, it's all about how we present our brand and our total city. It's how we identify and engage with potential visitors and how we recognise the power of consumer word of mouth and things like TripAdvisor and all those other rating websites. Our board considers that continued investment in this area is crucial to remain on and ahead of the curve and to be able to engage effectively with today's more informed traveller. Uh, the final result I want to discuss very briefly is the activity around business events. With the Town Hall and Dunedin Centre reopening and the appointment of a market leader as our conference and incentives manager, We've been able to bid for the return of large and quality events, attracting domestic and international visitors. Delegates represent opportunities way beyond their attendance at a conference, and also beyond their re potential as repeat visitors. We also emphasise the opportunity to consider the potential for knowledge sharing and relationship building. Um, by this we mean linking into our educational and business institutions, and fostering the opportunities those things represent. There is a huge amount more that can be done here. And finally, I stress that business and recreation events are not only very important in return on investment terms, but also in expanding the visitor season outside of the peaks. So a very brief summary. We've restructured tourism to Eden, recruited what I think is an exceptional staff, and have demonstrated results within our mandate, which are set out in the trustee. But as trustees who have properly exercised our government's responsibility and have looked beyond our immediate operational role, we've recognised there's much more to be done to really achieve the return on investment that the need and warrants, given its exceptional assets and its quite exceptional visitor infrastructure. Integrating branding into our operation over the last two years was just a small first step on this. It was a seamless step because we, as an organisation, understood the importance of a brand and how to present it. Integrating Tourism Dunedin's operation into Enterprise Dunedin is the second step. Integrating events, education, tourism product development and wider economic development as a third step to be taken. We consider that combining those three will truly achieve an integrated single marketing agency and take Dunedin further towards a return on that substantial investment that you're making in Dunedin as a destination. We've encouraged the transition and the amalgamation into Enterprise Dunedin because we as a board see that's the way Dunedin can move towards achieving its potential. So the future now rests with the City Council with Enterprise Dunedin. We wish John Christie and his team every success. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Councillor's questions. Councillor Pete. Um, thanks very much, Ray. 
uh, and for you and your um, other board members for putting in the effort. And it's quite a small board given how big the, uh, the, the, the tourism sector is for Dunedin. I just want to ask you um, just how you think the, um, the hotel infrastructure, which is mentioned in the report uh, of Dunedin, uh, how, how significant that would be if it were increased and just you know, where, how important it is to the future development of tourism for Dunedin. There are two ways in which I think it's really important. One is in sheer volume of beds, that's obvious. Um, and let's understand that we're, I think, fourth on the list for occupancy, even though there's been a shift away from, uh, uh, from buses and cruise boats. We've maintained a high level of occupancy and a very high level of yield. I think we're third on the yield charts for New Zealand. So there's a real opportunity there. But the key thing is context. What we don't have in Dunedin is a very high quality hotel which sets the level within which we can work. And if you have a top quality hotel, then you'll attract more people at the other levels. That also applies in the boutique accommodation. We've got some very good B&Bs, but we don't have a luxury lodge and we need one rather badly. Or some form of small luxury accommodation which sets out at the very top level. Now, I think the figures show that that's warranted, and I think our growth figures show it's even more warranted. And yes, there are hotels being developed, but I think we should be actively seeking out the top hotel chain. Someone, you know, the Hilton, 50% of their initial business is always from their mailing list. Someone like that group. Um, and I think that's a, an active pursuit that we should be doing as a city. Councillor Mann. In a number of conferences that, uh, that my wife goes to around the world, um, there has been quite a change from people going to hotels. Uh, rather than going to the standard hotels, there's a lot more Airbnb now. Do you see a similar trend here? And when you talk about boutique B&B, do you think the Airbnb uh, part of accommodation may be able to pick up the volume of beds that, that you were talking about, if, if we were to develop that consciously? Um, okay, two questions there. At this point, we're using B&Bs for conference work as well as hotels. We have a good network of good quality B&Bs, uh, and so they're doing pretty well. Airbnb I'm familiar with, very familiar with, they used it in Paris last year amongst other places. And that is an internet site, in case others are not familiar, that allows people to book their own homes or a bed in their own homes. That's directed very much at the um, individual traveller councillor, where the um, necessity to maintain a consistent level of standard um, is up to the individual person, they can select their own standard. At the conference you're looking for a consistent standard and more likely you're looking to have people pretty much together. So there will always be a strong place in the conference market for hotels. I think that's always going to be, be preeminent. You want people to work, to you know, drink together, to eat together, to go to breakout sessions together, so you'll always use hotels. And the Airbnb I think is directed at quite a different market. It's got its place, but I think it's at a different market. Thank you for that. Um, you also talked about the impact of the Christchurch earthquake and the growth of Queenstown as a hub. Yep. Uh, since before I was elected to council, there's been talk of extending the runway here. Since we own the land already, we don't have any hills in the way, as Queenstown does. Um, there, There is... There has been for a long time the potential for having a longer runway, and I noted in the ODT, I think, of last week, an aircraft unable to, so large it couldn't take off if it had a full complement of, of passengers because the, air, the, the airfield's not long enough. Do you think, from your perspective, given that you want to integrate tourism and economic development, that a longer runway would also help serve as an increased volume of beds would help serve the, the tourism market? Or do you think that that's not really a major factor? The, 
critical thing about having air conditions is actually getting people here. Uh, the, the, one of the reasons why John McCall's on our board is because of the importance of air travel. I'm not equipped to comment on the validity or not of extending the runway here. Getting in bigger aircraft means you can get in more people, but it also carries with it an obligation to work with the airlines and put funds into them to market your city with them. Now the airlines expect that, and we haven't had the funding in the past <coughs> to make the level of commitment that wide body jets would require out of us. The thing that, when I mentioned Queenstown and the expansion of Queenstown, the strategic stake that Auckland Airport has taken in Queenstown, so they fly people direct from the wide bodies down here. I was thinking that our, our most effective means of getting people to Dunedin is to work with the hubs. Now, in the past, there's only been one hub in the South Island, that's Christchurch for wide bodies. But Queenstown's going to compete with that and it's going to move beyond this fly and flop so called market into much more into general visitor, longer stay markets. So, the perspective that we had as a board in making that point was that we should be establishing as much as possible reasons for people who land in Queenstown to come here because the circuit's going to be around the lower South Island rather than the wider South Island. Does that answer the question? Yeah, basically you're saying that you accept that Dunedin isn't going to be a hub, that what we need to do is work with Queenstown that is. It may become a hub in the future, Councillor. I can't anticipate that. At this stage, um, we don't have the resources, in my view, to actually support the level of um, activity that would be required for wide body jets to come in here. Councillor White. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Ray, I'd like to congratulate you and your board for doing um, a great job. Um, I'd also like to make note of Hamish Saxon and the role that he played with Tourism Dunedin um, and, and uh, wish him the best going forward. Um, in your personal opinion, um, do you think that Tourism in Dunedin is adequately funded? Well, the answer to that is always going to be from a tourism operator's perspective, no, but um, you cut your cloth to suit the size of your budget. So I'm going to answer the question by saying that we had a budget and we achieved quite exceptional results with it, in my view. Um, the most effective RTO in the country that I've seen was um, David Perks in Wellington, but they had a budget of five million. And our RTO, in my view, in the last two and a half, three years after our restructuring has competed as probably the best RTO I've seen operating in the country, and I've seen a bunch of them. In terms of adequacy of funding, I think it's a job for the new Director of Enterprise Dunedin to determine, and I think it's going to be up to the Council to determine what level of activity it wants to generate. If it's looking for a greater level of results than we've been able to achieve, then I think it will have to put more funding in. If it wishes to maintain the same level and it keeps that same uh, group of people doing the work at the level that's being done, then you're going to get those. So, you know, I, as I say, I think that's a decision, a clear-sighted decision you're going to get advice on from your new director um, and it's a decision only the council can make. We've done our bit in our own way. More questions? Thank you, Ray. And can I take the opportunity to reiterate our appreciation of both you, you and the rest of your board members, not only in guiding uh, tourism journey through its last year, but also in a quite difficult transition into enterprise and leading. We really did appreciate your efforts in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Your Worship, Councillor Busy. Just before the Ray leaves. Um, yeah, I'd just like to share um, since, uh, the views of some of the, um, of the councillors who have expressed their thanks uh, for what the board's done, right? and uh, in particular yourself, but also um, Chris Oak Oakley and uh, John McCall and Graham Moore. Um, I think they've done a fantastic job um, over the years, and to answer um, my colleague's uh, question, I don't think you have been uh, adequately funded, given some of the other uh, funds that the regional tourism 
uh, agencies get. And the tourist industry, like the in industry that you're dealing with, is a very volatile industry, and I think you've done a fantastic job. And I think the uh, council uh, should have, um, well, I'd like to move that the council uh, write a letter of appreciation to the board um, and for the work that they've done. We had an opportunity to thank Hamish his last uh, time that he reported in, uh, but I think this is the occasion of <coughs> the last report from the board, and I'd like to uh, uh, believe that my colleagues would support me in uh, writing a letter to the, uh, the board and thank them for the work that they've done. Well, I'll second that, and could I um, have it passed by acclamation? And thank you. Hi, right, councillors. Um, item 19, growth assumptions of the long term. Can anyone remove the motion? I'll move, I'll move that the report be noted. And I'll second. Oh, no. no. I take it there's no further discussion. Councillor Pete. Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I think we shouldn't let this go without a bit of discussion, actually, uh, Your Worship. And um, the curtain might be coming down on tourism in Dunedin today. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it's, it, it's uh, signalling to me just how much more work is yet to be done in terms of the way we promote tourism in Dunedin uh, and how we provide the infrastructure for it. What comes out of this report for me is a couple of surprises. The first one is that in terms of the visitor night stats, we are at 2.5% of the national figure. And that seems to me rather low. I would have thought we were going to be aiming much higher than that. Um, Hamish Saxton says in there, he uses the, the phrase, appeared to underperform in there, uh, although the stats show an, a, an increasing trend for visitors, um, uh, I think that, that we can do uh, a whole bunch better, uh, and I would like to see us use our unique attractions, particularly in the wildlife sector. I think we underplay what we have in New Zealand. Um, in Dunedin, rather, uh, uh, in terms of, of what we have for wildlife attractions here. Just uh, incredible. Uh, and I would like to see Enterprise uh, uh, Dunedin actually pick up uh, on that and, and begin to, to, uh, to make, make tourism swing a bit more in that direction. In, in terms of the, of the conferences and, and, uh, and conventions, I think that is another area which we are going to uh, are going to have to increase in terms of to make the most of our amenities here. Uh, and there is a signal in here that we need to make, make that move now before 2017, before Queenstown and Christchurch begin to gobble up uh, a lot of that business. And I think that's very important that we need to keep our eye on the ball. This is the time for tourism to need and to, to bow out, but for enterprise to need and to really pick up that baton. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to uh, support what uh, Councillor Peter said, um, but if you have a look at um, our economic development strategy and the import that tourism Dunedin had and, and, uh, and um, the uh, Dunedin International Airport as well um, with regards to tourism and connectivity, I think that work is going to be done. Uh, I'm really confident and it will be up to this Council with regards to what sort of funds we do apply to it. Um, but it's in our economic development strategy and it really comes back to us now to be able to push that forward. Further speakers? There being none, I will put the um, motion that the report be noted. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Right, now we are on to item 19. Um, and can I invite uh, <coughs> Tyne and Neville up? Growth assumptions in the long term plan. <coughs> Would you like to kick off, or Susie? Things away, or? So the report's really recommending on the basis of recent advice from Statistics New Zealand that the Council uses the 2009 Council gross projections in the long term plan and note the implications for the development contributions policy and also agree that um, in early 2015 when Statistics New Zealand released their final population projections based on the 2013 census that the projections for the Council be updated and applied. 
Questions about Councillor McTash? My question is just, um, I mean, the timing seems really unfortunate and perhaps there's nothing that can be done about it, but is this the same for councils all over the country? Are they all facing the same situation with Stats New Zealand? Yes, they are. Yeah. And if that's the case, then is this not something that local government New Zealand could have a conversation with Stats New Zealand about and just say, hey guys, um, this is really not ideal. It impacts on budgets all over the place and could we get those figures any earlier? I understand that um, someone did make an approach and Statistics New Zealand considered it and provided some advice to councils on that basis about what they could provide, which is, I guess, this interim advice that we're presenting here. And just um, so that I understand the implications for the development contributions policy, that means that what we would be going out for consultation on is actually not what we'll be probably <coughs> be adopting. Is that right? So we'll be revising something for the purposes of consultation, which actually then will change after it comes. Because I'm assuming that it won't take between February and I'm assuming that between February and May, when we have our final deliberations, that new um, report from Stats New Zealand will be able to be worked up into something which can be included in the LTP. So my understanding is the timing is that um, capital budgets and things like that are kind of being decided fairly soon and that, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's feasible to wait until February, mid-February when stats release the final projections and then we prepare our projections based on that and then incorporate that. I understand. That yeah, no, I understand <coughs> from the perspective of the draft, which is what we will need to be considering in late January for the purposes of consultation. But if we're then getting feedback in February from Stats New Zealand, then presumably that would be worked through in the months between February when, we, when we're out for consultation and May when we deliberate and decide on the draft, in which case the development contributions staff would actually be subject to change anyway, would it not? Um, that often happens if most years anyway because of the changes in the capital program as we, um, from the decision making in May. But I understand. I, I understand that, but my concern is if what we're doing is saying we will revise development contributions and go out for consultation on another, on changes, that is likely to upset a bunch of people and actually the impact might, it might be wrong that we're actually, we, it, it may not, what we're cons consulting on is unlikely to be the final impact anyway. <coughs> so is there not another way that we could manage the process to avoid giving the wrong impression on what we're going to do with DCs? Yeah, so Yeah. Could we maybe come follow that out and come back to you? Yeah. That's fine, but I think it has an implication for. I, maybe I should have sent it through in advance. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, my sense is that it might have an implication for whether we go for option one or option two or another option. Our understanding is that the, the changes won't be that great. So, um, but until we see what happens and what are in February. Can I just clarify that question because I think it goes to the heart of the second recommendation where we note the implications for the development contributions policy but I, but I guess what Councillor McTavish is saying is we don't know what the implications will be that we're noting. That's effectively it. That's right Your Worship. What I'm concerned about is that um, when we go out for consultation on a changed development contributions policy Presumably everyone would assume that that is what we will be doing and we know in fact that that is highly unlikely to be what we'll be doing because we'll be revising them on the basis of February's figures. So, but moving, but my point is that moving on from that, the second recommendation notes the implications, but we can't quantify them now. All we're noting is that they will change and your question is, is that good enough? 
no, uh, not right. entirely. Um, so the, the, my understanding is if we adopt the 2009 projections, that is a change to our existing DC's policy. So we need to revamp our DC's policy on the basis of those 2009 projections. That, that means that we would be signalling a change in our January consultation, after our January meeting and our consultation documents, but we would be doing so even knowing that that is not going to be the final position and that we will act, in fact need to be revamping DCs again come May. So I'm unclear as to how we signal that or whether or not there's a way to avoid doing that. That's what I'm seeking advice on. And I'll just um, check with the staff. We could, when we go out and consult, put out the data that's associated with the 2009 projections. We can also provide the data that's associated with the 12, 2012 low growth scenario and put those both out as part of the consultation document and outline that at this point in time, the expectation is that growth will fall within the spend and that we will keep people updated as the statistics New Zealand figures come through. And part of this has been um, brought upon us by a delayed census and so on. So we're all stuck I mean, all around the country in this position. I think um, Jane is right in that the, the, if you look at the numbers, the implications aren't that huge for us in a way that they are for some other cities where it really makes quite a big percentage difference in the development contributions. For us, the difference is fairly modest, but we are able to describe the likely range in that consultation process. Can I just add, I think the timing will be such that we may have those figures before we actually have to sign off on mm. the consultation document. And the, I think we're due to adopt the consultation document on the 23rd of February, so we may have seen those figures by then. Again, that's a little bit uncertain as yet. Councillor Backus. Given that Statistics New Zealand have flagged a low growth population scenario, which uh, the Chief Executive, uh, I think, quite modestly says will have a modest impact, I would have said bugger all. Why would we spend $5,000 um, trying to get some consistency when what we're talking about is very little change anyway? Unless perhaps spending $5,000 was seen as a positive. <coughs> I think it's just around being sure that we haven't got a level of change that causes a problem. But, um, yeah. At the moment we're using two different sets of figures and we know that that isn't correct. We're absolutely certain that both of them can't be right and the truth is probably lying somewhere in the middle. Um, the question is, do we want to adopt a slightly more conservative, the more conservative of the two figures? In fact, the, the correct figure is likely to be slightly below that still. Is it not the case, though, that the difference between the figures is almost margin of error when it comes to doing these sorts of statistics anyway? Um, and given that we're not a big high growth city, can't we just put up with a little inconsistency till next year? That would, that would, option two would be my plain preference from that point of view. I think this may have been answered by Sue, but if we're going to put out, which seems to me part of the answer, namely we've got these two different figures and then not much different, but we're just signalling either of them or a slight adjustment to either of them, can we also put out the effect, the financial effect on us of one or, or the other because that, if it's bugger all then bugger all times X number of um, households isn't going to make any difference. You know, what is the bugger all figure of, in a contribution sense? We can but do that. Can, can we put just the whole package out and just say we don't you know? Think of you, it's a but at the bottom end, because yeah, yeah, we've got to budget surely on the conservative less income end in any case. We, for development contributions, bearing in mind that we don't budget on income, we yeah. what we've said is it's so unpredictable that we don't we don't.
pre-spend what we anticipate will come in, we wait till the end of the year, then say what it is and then apply it appropriately to debt. So, um, so in that sense, for the development contributions themselves, it doesn't have much predictive impact. So, so we can just put that out there when we're doing the consultation and just say it's a band. The whole lot of what we're any guesstimate about tomorrow is a band, anyway, isn't it? Councillor Thompson. Oh, look, it's a, it's a similar question really, I suppose it arises because I just couldn't see in the report what the actual implication was for the development contributions and that prompted for me um, a, uh, a question around uh, if, if it is, um, to quote Councillor Van der bugger all, then probably it's not a concern but um, if, if it weren't to be bugger all on a large project and we were to be basing our development contributions on a demonstrably um, false premise, um, at least based on the information provided to us by Statistics New Zealand, would that put us at some risk of um, getting in, in a dispute with, with the developer? I'm not sure that I can answer all of that. I, I guess um, I'm what we were aiming to do in the report was use the best information that we have available at this time, which is based on the recent advice from Statistics New Zealand that the population hasn't grown as much as they predicted um, between 2006 and 2013. And therefore they're suggesting a lower growth scenario in the short term. So well, I guess what we were aiming to do was to use the best information that we have, which is that um, Currently, of the two series we have, 2009 and 2012, the 2009 projections are a closer fit to that kind of lower growth that has been over the last while. And I guess in the absence of final figures from Statistics New Zealand, it's, it's a bit hard to tell. Um, I suppose because of the complexities of um, the development contributions, every time we re-engage in this debate, I just about have to go back and read the whole thing from the beginning again. Um, but uh, if if the impact on charging was in the margin of error, then um, it isn't the $5,000 cost that bothers me, but uh, it, it is the, the time involved. Um, uh, then I would perhaps have a different view around whether or not our consultation should, shouldn't be, look, this is where it is at the moment, in another few months' time we'll have an accurate figure and we'll revise it. You need to understand that in the meantime there's some potential margin of error in here. I mean, can we, is, that, is that a permissible approach? I think so. Councillor Peter. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this may be on a bit of a tangent, but um, I, when I first read this I just thought a low growth uh, population scenario uh, might not be consistent with our economic development strategies, 10,000 jobs in 10 years. And I just wondered if someone could kind of get, help me fit those two uh, uh, projections together. It's aspirational. was consistent. I'm not entirely convinced statistics New Zealand give any weight to any of our strategies. <laughs> Yeah, I did. It's just in relation to, because um, I think that there are two, there are, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are two impacts of the use of these stats. One is on LTP figures, which include but are not exclusive to development contributions, and the other is development contributions. In that context, does it cause problems if we're using we're still using 2000 or which which year's numbers are we currently intending to use for LTP figure development? The intention is to use the 2009 series. Right, so there is no, the, the result <coughs> of, the, of our decision really is limited to figures used in development contributions today. That's right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sorry, I'm feeling like I've lost um, something in this debate and I've listened to the answers and I'm just wondering, does this decision, considering your answer just now about development contributions, need to be made now or can it be made in February before we do the, um, so we actually know what those figures are? Because I, I've, I've, 
I'm, I'm slightly confused what has been made today. Okay, so we're progressing work on the city profiling and the infrastructure strategy and all the modelling done by the council is done currently <coughs> in the 2009 figures. Um, we were looking to get some consistency across the process um, by getting the decision at the moment. But I guess that we could, could leave the decision around um, development contributions till January or February. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Would someone like to move the recommendations or move? Councillor Bazet. No, I'm quite happy with the recommendations. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move. Second, Councillor Staines. Do you wish to speak to no, Councillor Bazet? No, no, no. <coughs> I mean, Councillor Peach makes a, a good um, uh, uh, raise a good point with regards to uh, our garden strategy. You know, you bring that into the equation. Who's going to be right anyway? So, um, look, it's, it's not a big issue, I, I don't think. It's always been a bit, a little, uh, a bit precious or pedantic, I think. <coughs> Councillor McTash. Just a question of the mover and seconder. You're moving what's on the order paper? Yes. And the knowledge that that is option one? Yes. Okay. Right. And my take on this is that, from the discussion, that we put into the consultation document as much clarity about the range of implications both for council and for developers as is possible. And then basically the community has got, have got as much information as we have uh, on which to make uh, basically the submissions and we have to make our decisions. Is that? Um, Councillor Thompson. Sorry, I just, I, I said, I'd, I'd really challenge anyone to vote on this knowing quite clearly that they understand what it is they're voting on. I'm quite happy to acknowledge that I don't. Um, not that that's anything particularly yeah, unusual. Um, I, I'm just having a little bit of difficulty reconciling the options as outlined under option one with the recommendations that we're about to vote on because the, the, the recommendation to me seems to uh, enable us to leave the inconsistency in there. It's, whereas the explanation under option one says that it, one of the, the implications is that um, we, would have to, we would have to go ahead and make some changes to the development contributions assumptions. So I, I can't quite reconcile those two things. It is, I, I, but I, I may be mis misinterpreting it. Um, but the recommendation, I'm quite happy to vote for the recommendation, but it's doesn't read quite as option one seems to imply is intended to. I think you're right, and we should. Give me a comment. Are we consistent? So, what the. Maybe to summarise my understanding of the paper, because it is a, a complex issue and we've had this discussion that, the, that at the moment we're using two different sets of figures. We're using 2012 in the development contributions policy and the 2009 projections in the LTP. And we thought the 2009 projections would probably change and we would be doing an update, but actually the statistics, New Zealand advice suggests that that would be unwise. And so we won't be reassessing everything using the 2012 figures. We'll be leaving the 2009, you know, the, the 2009 projections. We'll be continuing to use that for the LTP because that appears to be closer to where we're going. Where that leaves us with then is two different sets of figures. So given we're not going to update the LTP to two, 2012 figures, it seems sensible for us to bring the development contributions back to the 2009 figures so that right through the LTP we're using some standard data, bearing in mind that in February we may find out that the 2009 projections are also too high, in which case we may have to pull the development contributions back a little further. But we might not know that at the point at which we have to go out to consultation. We are confident, though, that the 2009 projections are probably more accurate than the 2012 projections now that we have this interim data available from Statistics New Zealand. So for a relatively modest cost, 
we can adjust the development contributions figures in the meanwhile, so we're using a consistent set of data right across the LTP. One thing we won't be able to do is fix all of the LTP figures the minute Statistics New Zealand gives us their new projections in February. It will just simply be too late for the LTP. Yep. Uh, well, it was a question. To I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being anal retentive, and, but the, I'm happy to vote for the recommendation. I'm just trying to clarify that as I read the recommendation, it's, it's saying that we will in fact wait until we've got the information in early 2015 before we start buggerising around with everything else. The opposite. Recommendation. No. Agree that new growth projections be prepared and consistently applied across all activities when updated information is made available to the Council in early 2015. But that is the one that you, it's the one that relates to action. Um, oh, you quite right. As I said, I didn't understand it. Um, can I suggest that it would be easier if the recommendations identified the option? Then it would be clear what we're voting on. If, if, because there is confusion, obviously. But Councillor Calvin, um, you're speaking to the... Whatever it is, yeah. Yes. Yes, I was intending to speak to whatever it is. Um, I think we're just being told that they won't be consistent then anyway because they won't all be updated in time. And no, if we update the development contributions, then everything will be consistently using the 2009 projections. That's what option two will give you. Yes. What will then happen is sometime in February or March or maybe April, we'll get a whole new series, in which case nothing will be consistent with that. We may be able to fix the development contributions in time, but we certainly won't be able to fix the rest of the LTP in time. So that being in... That's... That being the position in... Recommendation you know, two being option one. Yeah. So that being the position, and they're not going to be consistent with best evidence stats when we're going into it early next year, why can't we just say that as regards the development fund contributions, we've got nine and 12 and somewhere in between there and it's not much different anyway. Leave it alone, don't do the $5,000 worth of whatever it is on it. Just leave it alone as we're not sure it's a band. That's knowing, option two. Yeah, knowing that well, option one doesn't mention actually spending the money and doing whatever it is, but knowing that they won't be consistently according to stat New no. Zealand. It mentions it in under disadvantages, the first. No, under the recommendations, it doesn't. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but knowing that we won't have them all consistently according to evidence based position, namely stats New Zealand when we do it anyway. We don't know if we'll have the Stats New Zealand evidence base by then. We, we think we might, but we don't know. So we just don't know. Okay. <clears throat> it's been moved to second. Are there further speakers? Councillor White. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, you know what, regardless of the recommendations, you know, I've got real concern about we looking at a low growth population scenario, and I think we really, as councillors, have to really look at that sentence from Statistics New Zealand and say, that's what we've got to really look at in the next two years, because um, that's a real, a real worry to me, and I think we really need to address that for new government coming in. We also need to basically target them, and especially following on if anybody saw Sunday last night, where they talked about Wanganui and the regions, but I, as soon as I see low growth population scenarios, I really get worried. So we need to get a little stronger in that area. I'm, I'm too old. <laughs> Councillor McTavis, did you? Yeah, I'll yeah. speak to the motion if I yeah. can. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering whether the mover and the seconder would entertain a a number three inserted between the current two and three, which says that, says 
that council that the council note that the development contributions policy will explain the lack of certainty in consultation documents if necessary, and that's just to be consistent with the chief executive's comments. So the council was it? The council stands. You have it. Can I just hear it again, please? It seems to me further. Note that the development contributions policy will explain the lack of certainty in consultation documents if necessary. Okay. And look, I'm not going to die in a ditch over this. Personally, I think that we could leave it um, inconsistent. I don't think it it causes it. I don't think it would be the end of the world given the uncertainty that we the inherent <coughs> uncertainty that we have anyway. But because I don't have figures telling me that that impact may be significant or not for particular projects, as Councillor Thompson outlined, I don't feel comfortable endorsing that position today. So in the interests of um, the precautionary principle, which I think is one of the principles that we should employ around this table, um, I, would, I will support this motion with that amendment. Not weird, not it. So can, um, did you get that, Pam? Mm -hmm. And can I clarify, Councillor McTavish, you said that the explanation in the development contributions consultation, I think it's the it's the LTP consultation, or correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's in here, that's fine, okay, thank you. It's, it will be within yep, the, con the special consultative procedure. As it's written, it's fine, that's good. Alright, that's the fourth part of the recommendation, are the further speakers? Right, then being none, Councillor Bazette, do you wish to excise your right of reply? Okay, it's, it's the recommendations plus the, it's a four I think actually, Pam. Oh, it's three, okay. So it'll be one, two, this one, and then the last one be four. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? No, recorded, please. That's <coughs> carried. Okay, um, on to, thank you, thank you, Jane. On to item 20. Can you move? <laughs> it's all very fine for you. All very fine for you. Um, this is the um, local alcohol policy uh, recommendations on the hearing panel. Ms. Graham, have you had anything to say? Any, up to, any questions from anyone? Andrew. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Worship. Is there any chance that? Uh, some sort of um, hearing or session could be held before the students leave town? Is that timing? I'm sure we can look at it. My understanding is that the hearings are set down for mid-November. But uh, again, it will, have to, it will depend how much work there is involved in getting it set up, but I'll certainly pass that along and do what we can. We could potentially look at garnering online submissions, I mean, you know, hearing from them electronically potentially or even having a, a, even a workshop or a meeting down at the I'll university and engaging with students before they yeah. leave town certainly feed that through are there any further um, questions councillor wilson just on that if um, i'm interested if there were enough submitters would the panel and just taking it slightly off the this um, item would the panel be able to do hearings in localities where there may be a greater sense, or a greater number of submitters. We'll certainly look at that. You mean a bar or something like that? <coughs> uh, right. I Any further questions? It's been moved. Councillor Benson Pope. Is there a seconder? Councillor Bazette. Discussion. Councillor Benson Pope, do you wish to speak to it? No, just to say, I think this is a very sensible suggestion and good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Damn this thing. All right, are there any other speakers? I'm going to put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carry. <coughs> Item 21, uh, representation review. Uh, this is for noting only. It's an update. Um, question. Oh, Ms. Graham, do you wish to? Questions? Oh, we were, do you Questions? No questions? Right. Moved, Councillor Bazette. Second, Councillor Wilson. Discussion? I'll put all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. 
Thank you. Well, that's the end of the uh, public part of the meeting, so I'll move from the Chair that the public be excluded from the following parts of the proceedings of this meeting as per the order paper, items 22 to 29. Second to Councillor Staines. Discussion. I'll put all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And could I suggest a five minute break um, while um, the guys pack up and one thing another? So, all those.